reasons. <laughs> so students, faculty, staff, alumni, others who participate in any of the following seminars with their camera on or use a profile image are agreeing to have their video or image recorded solely for the purpose of creating a record for the participants in this seminar to refer to, including those enrolled students who are unable to attend live. If you are unwilling to consent to have your profile or video image recorded, be sure to keep your camera off and do not use a profile image. Likewise, participants who unmute during the seminar or class and participate orally are agreeing to have their voices recorded. If you are not willing to consent to have your voice recorded, you will need to keep your mute button activated and communicate exclusively using the chat feature, which allows participants to type questions and comments live. Okay. okay. Just introduce the speaker again. Thank you, everyone, for coming uh, early morning, New York time, in order to uh, to listen to Professor Ekman. Uh, Professor James Ekman is the Henry Schultz Distinguished Service Professor of Economics at the University of Chicago. Uh, as we all know, he got the Nobel Memorial Prize winner uh, in economics in 2000 uh, for his development of theory and methods for analyzing selective samples. He got it uh, together with Daniel McFadden uh, for his development uh, of theory and method of analyzing discrete choice. Uh, Professor Heckman got the John Bates Clark Medal in 1983 and the Frisch Medal in 2014. He's an expert in economics of human development. So the university's Center for the Economic of Human Development he has conducted work with the consortium of uh, individuals, uh, economists, developmental psychologists, sociologists, st st statisticians, of course, and neuroscientists. His research shows that uh, quality early childhood, childhood development heavily influences health, economic and social outcomes for individual and society at large, and I'm sure we'll talk about it, uh, he will talk about it more today. Ekman has shown uh, that there are great economic uh, gains to be had by investing in early childhood development. He received his BA in mathematics from Colorado College in 1965, his PhD in economics from Princeton University in 1971. Remember, Jim, we talked about this in the past, mentioning uh, Will Baumel, who was also a graduate of the City University of New York. Since 1973, he has served as a professor of economics at the University of Chicago, where he directs the Economic Research Center, the Center for Economic of Human Development, the Center for Social Program Evaluation at the Harris School of Public Policy. He's a professor of law at the University of Chicago School of Law, senior research fellow at the American Bar Foundation, research fellow at the Institute for Fiscal Studies. He's currently editor of the Journal of Political Economy. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the Econometric Society, the Society of Labor Economics, the American Statistical Association. He's also a fellow of the American Academy of uh, Arts and Sciences. Professor Heckman has published over 300 articles, several books. His most recent one include Giving Kids a Fair Chance, strategies at work. The next one is inequality in America, what role of human capital policy, what are the roles, or what is the role of human capital policy, and another book is law and employment, lesson from Latin America and the Caribbean, and the, the fourth book that I think is the well known, the myth of achievement test, the general education development, uh, and the role of character in America. Um, his doctoral uh, student, among them, uh, you know, I'm sure George Borach and my friend uh, Mark Rosenzweig, that I think visited our seminar a few years ago when I was running it. I met uh, Jim in 2007 in Tunisia, <clears throat> so very, uh, very late in our careers, but uh, really uh, we still enjoy it very much. As far as his talk, he's going to talk about American inequality and social mobility viewed through the Danish prism. Uh, some promotion for today. Uh, so later on, we are going to listen to Richmond, who is a PhD student at the CUNY City University of New York. And just to remind you, next week is the last seminar, and we are going to have um, another Nobel laureate, the 11th this semester, uh, my friend uh, Finn Kidland. Jim, the floor is yours. Thank you for coming.
Okay, thank you very much. I got to get a full screen view here. Uh, uh, hold on a second here. Wait, I'm still not getting a full screen view. I'm, somehow I'm if you trying to get, uh, I'll get it. Uh, don't worry, just a second. Somehow it's taking a little longer than uh, it should. Yeah, okay, that's fine. That's good. Okay. Oh, but wait. You share screen at the middle. Yeah, no, okay. I'm sharing screen. I think I'm okay. Hello? We see, yeah, yeah, we hear you. Okay, go ahead. Okay, good. Okay, great. Yeah, I'm just trying to, uh, okay, good. Okay, well, it's my pleasure today to talk to you about a topic that uh, I'm very actively engaged in uh, researching and with a team of people. Um, I'll identify my partners in research. Um, it's uh, a topic that I think is really central to the discussions that have taken place uh, all around the world and certainly in the United States and dominated some of the discussion anyway, uh, most of the discussion I would argue, that and race uh, regarding in the 2020 uh, presidential election and will continue to dominate policy, especially as you look at the new advisors coming into the uh, Biden administration. This work is joint with uh, uh, Rasmus Landerso. Uh, Landerso was a postdoc at the University of Chicago, uh, uh, has a PhD from Aarhus in uh, Denmark, and is currently at the Rockwell Foundation which is a major group, which is supporting this work uh, that we're doing together. And uh, he's, a, see, he's a young guy, but a very bright guy with a promising future. And I really enjoy working with him. Uh, how do I advance this now? Scott, this is crazy. This is, okay, no, okay, yeah. Okay, so, so hold on a second. Am I gonna have to rely on you to do this? Here, yeah, just respond though. Okay, fine. I got it. Yeah. Okay. Just, just click on the picture and then. Oh, I did. I just responded slowly. That's all right. Okay, that's okay. fine. So, uh, I, and I would emphasize that this is a sponsored project from the Center for the Economics of Human Development, which is a group at the University of Chicago affiliated with the Department of Economics and the Social Science Division that's studying the evolution of human skills, their measurement, their implications how we can develop them and what uh, general policy should be taken towards fostering those skills. Skills are a cornerstone of the whole question of inequality. And this paper is in part about skills and how they're formed. But this is now, I'm really gonna put together not just a single paper, but a series of papers into a kind of an overview, hopefully a consistently uh, coherent overview uh, of uh, our work. Steve Durloff here, my colleague, a graduate student here named Neil Choley, a former graduate student who's now teaching at the University of Copenhagen, Miriam Ginsowski, Christian Carlson, who is a sociologist at the University of Copenhagen, Rafe Kershi, who is a, a doctoral student here at the University of Chicago, and Sadek Asagnia, who is actually at the University of Chicago as a postdoc. So I'm gonna report on our collective uh, research. And so what I'm gonna talk about today is inequality and social mobility, and really comparing the situation in two countries, the US and in Denmark. Now, Denmark has received a lot of attention and uh, it's received a lot of attention since Bernie Sanders kind of made it his ideal in the 2016 election uh, and also in the most recent primary elections. Hillary Clinton and many others have pointed to Denmark as a model that America might uh, imitate in order to try to achieve a good model of mobility and reducing not only mobility, uh, not only reducing inequality, but promoting mobility across generations. So a standard tool in this literature is the tool called the, uh, the Great Gatsby Curve, uh, so named by the uh, uh, late uh, Alan uh, Kruger, who was uh, uh, 
uh, at the Council of Economic Advisors uh, when they coined this term. But this, uh, this work and this particular version of the curve uh, is attributable to uh, Miles Korak uh, in his paper, Inequality from Generation to Generation. And mice what? is around. Mice What's is, that? And mice is one of the audience here. Mice, say hello. Oh, yeah, I'm here. Thanks very much for that. Okay, sure. well, no, thanks very much for the work. Are you at, are you at CUNY? Yeah, I, um, I left Canada two years ago. So this is my, starting my third semester, a uh, third year at CUNY. I see. Okay. Well, congratulations. Thank you. A little different world in New York than in Canada, I guess. But... Uh, a little bit, yeah. And it's not Denmark <laughs> either, yeah. Uh, no, it's not Denmark. Okay, it's great to have you on. I really look forward to your commentary. So the Korak curve or the Gatsby curve uh, really is a relationship between two different concepts. The first is the coefficient beta that you see at the head of that uh, on the top of the graph there. If you regress the income of the child, and here we're gonna look at something like uh, uh, some measure of income, and I'll come back to what those measures of income might be and how they affect this curve and later, later in this talk. Uh, and then the, so the income of the child and the income of the parent. And there's a huge literature about where you should measure this income, whether you should include the income of the entire family or the income of the father or the income of the mother. I'll let Miles take all those questions, but nonetheless, what I'm gonna talk about today is a relationship of this beta, which is really uh, income of child, income of parents, and regressing or relating that anyway to inequality and in Gini coefficient in family income across countries. And so if you look at this, you'll see a very striking pattern, which has captured the fancy of many economists and public policy makers. Namely, you'll see, so a higher beta is associated with more immobility, less mobility. So you can see that the Nordic countries generally are countries with low values of beta. And, uh, uh, and countries in Latin America have some of the highest values of beta. Uh, with other countries, fin uh, Canada is very low in terms of beta, um, uh, China very high, although that's a, that's a fragile number and it keeps being revised, but nonetheless. So the relationship though, is that the generally found as an empirical relationship is as inequality increases in the sense of increasing family income, beta uh, immobility also increases. And a lot of work has been done in trying to build models to explain that. Lots of models around. And uh, I think there, some of them are pretty well known. Uh, I'm not gonna, Gary Solon has a particularly very tractable model. Becker has a recent paper, the late Gary Becker, but had a recent paper in the uh, JPE just two years ago, trying to explain this phenomena by a more or less reverse causality. And uh, there has been nonetheless a lot of work about this curve. It's been interpreted in different ways. It's been interpreted as saying, if we reduce inequality in a cross-section sense, we promote mobility. Uh, but it also has been for, uh, interpreted the other way that if we actually reduce uh, the, the beta, we're gonna have higher inequality. That's kind of the Becker interpretation. But nonetheless, it's a very important curve. It's so important, and this, uh, this message from this curve and the general discussion of Scandinavian work is very, very important uh, to the public policy discussion. This predates uh, Bernie Sanders, may have inspired him, but really this quote from the Washington Post six years ago now is still widely held, namely that Scandinavia is a model and America might learn from that model. So that's what motivated our concern, right? trying to see what was different about Scandinavia uh, from what's going on in the US. And we're hardly the first to do this. So I don't wanna pretend that we're the first ones to look at it, but we have some interesting perspectives here and I'd like to get them I really value your, uh, your feedback. And in fact, harsh criticism if there is some. So what so do we know? I have, oh, yeah. a question. I have a question to you that maybe Mike can answer. Did you look also at gender, uh, industry, agriculture? 
Well, not in these... this graph. Miles can answer that question. Miles, I mean, you've done this for many different ways to define income, whether or not it's the income of the child, a single child, or the income of the collective of the child. Uh, you know, there's a whole literature, right, looking at the uh, at some notion of uh, why not as being the curve for the uh, for the mother uh, alone. So the female parent on the female child. Uh, generally speaking, it's either been the income of the father for why not because it's measured, or the income of the family. But Miles, you can speak to that, please. No, no, no I think that's right. Uh, the graph you have is actually the father-son elasticity, and and oh. the challenge there was. Uh, trying to get as many countries as possible when this was done in the late 90s, early two, 2000s. Okay. And obviously, the literature has grown a lot there. So my, but my I, think we should, I think we should really take this as the way you've done it as a, a, a conversation uh, starter to get you into more detailed analysis of particular dyads or comparisons that are, are, are judicious. So, um, you know, positing the, um, the, the Nordic countries as something interesting because it's at a low end versus the US is sort of the way to go. And then you, in your research, you just focus more closely on very careful uh, definitions of the data so that the results can be fully comparable. But what we've got here, our father is son's elasticities as best as I could put them together uh, almost 20 years ago. When you say son, do you mean the first born son, the second born son, the third one? Uh, generally, that varies a little bit. Uh, I think in the famous paper by Gary Solon, he took, if I remember correctly, firstborn sons. Maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Jim. Um, yeah, but, so. you know, it spawns a different literature. There's a whole literature that branches off on that, on siblings' effects and parity. Uh, so this is just sort of the first cut to get, it, get research going, really. Okay. Okay, very good. So, um, no, Gary, you should, I'd be happy to listen to you give this talk. Uh, <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear you speak. <laughs> no, but Miles, I really think it would be, no, but there are a bunch of people out there that I'd be very curious to hear their views of, but Miles, I'd be very interested. Okay, well, let me go forward. And uh, I think that is a whole issue though. And, I, and I'll try to give you some partial, partial answer to that question as I go through, but we're working on this. And Miles, I'd be particularly interested in, in your telling me about recent work that we haven't yet known or that's, that's, that's better than what we've done or as close to what we've done because. Great, let's, let's do that towards the end of your talk and I'll, I'll make yes, a point please. of thinking about that. That's good. Yeah, okay. and as a remark, we have a center about inequalities that Paul Krugman and Miles are working on together and others at, at City University, go ahead. Yes. Okay, very good. Put me on your mailing list too, if you uh, or your okay. mailing list. I, I would like to, be, yes. like to be informed, please. Absolutely. I will surely uh, do that. Okay, sure. very good. All right, so let me, so here, this is the theme that's dominated a lot of discussion. The books are written on this theme all by itself, many books. So reason why people are so interested in Denmark and in particular Scandinavia, Scandinavia cluster really with Denmark being kind of a leading leading representative is that uh, recent Danish cohorts are doing more or less the same as their parents, unlike what happens in the US. So for example, looking at a recent paper by the Chetty group, um, if we look at the question of absolute mobility, which is the probability that children do better than parents uh, by cohort, looking at the US pre-tax and transfer data, what we can see is that in the 1940 period, there was a very high prevalence of people going above the, doing better than their parents. Doesn't say how much better, but nonetheless better. But that's actually declining as we go across cohorts. And so if we look at the 1980 cohort, birth cohorts, what we find is the percentage of children are, and this is all measured roughly at the same age. And so we can see a real falling off. Uh, in the US. And another way to see it is uh, just taking the 70 and 80 cohort and breaking them out of that figure. You can see that uh, things seem to be getting worse in the US and they're still not so good. Uh, in 
Denmark, if we look at pre-tax and transfer income, we see a pattern, uh, this pattern, downward spend, but the pattern hasn't changed much between 70 and 80. The pattern is uh, not as flat as maybe in the US, but it definitely is uh, not changing very much, which is interesting too. So the question today is what do we learn about, and there are many other ways to, to compare Denmark and, uh, and uh, uh, the US. And so I'm going to uh, uh, focus on this question. And so what should we learn from Scandinavia? And I'm gonna use Denmark. So for us, Denmark is a laboratory for understanding the sources of inequality and social mobility. So reducing inequality and promoting social mobility is a central focus of the modern Danish welfare state and has been for quite some time. And I would argue that many traditional explanations of inequality and social mobility are not holding in Denmark. And what I wanna do is I look at fresh, uh, take a fresh look at the origins of inequality. And I wanna make a very clear distinction between equality in services offered, which is mandated, Things like healthcare, teachers are paid exactly the same everywhere. There's universal free daycare. College is free if you qualify for it, which means you have to graduate college, high school. But nonetheless, uh, if you get admitted to college, there's no tuition cost. Uh, greater social cohesion in Denmark, and the Danes uh, very much were cohering in shutting down the economy their policies towards shutting down the economy were much less draconian. The Danes were uh, subsidizing workers on the job, even when the firms weren't producing. Um, and what we know is that post tax and transfers, income inequality is low. So there's a lot of what could be called social efficacy, a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of group uh, solidarity. Um, but what I wanna to argue today is that some of this inequality, uh, some of this equality, what you see is not due to superior production of human capital. And in fact, amazing, despite the features I just gave you and we'll elaborate on further, the educational mobility is remarkably similar in the US and Denmark. And I wanna argue that despite what looks like a very egalitarian state, and I'll document even how more egalitarian it is than what I just described. There's still substantial skill and education gaps across families by background. So what I would argue, and this is something that has been remarked on in the literature, but we have a particularly striking example of it, is that the advantages from Denmark's universal access to services are reaped more by the affluent. And this is something we find in every country. Uh, there's something called the Matthew effect, to those who have more is given. And part of it is really the parental activity, that when you make programs available to families, the more affluent, the more educated parents are the ones who generally get the benefits, at least if they're offered on a, you know, take in a universal way. Uh, we find that. We find that in the U.S. and we find it here in Denmark to a very strong extent. But what we also find is something that's universal, at least is com comparable between the US and Denmark, which is a very strong sorting of families by parental income and education. And what we wanna argue is that the power of place is a consequence of family sorting and family influence. And what has been neglected in the discussion, and this is also true, I think, in the, in the analysis by Chetty and his group, is that families are purposely choosing neighborhoods and the timing of moves. The identification strategy, for those who are aware of those papers, really requires conditioning on certain initial variables, moves are random, but they're not. And in fact, they're very, very determined. We've studied ex extensively with very detailed Danish data. So what we find is that sorting in Denmark among, among more educated people, among more affluent people, different ways to measure is comparable to that in the US. And I wanna argue that these sorting effects, definitely uh, the sorting effects estimated the IGEs. 
And so what we find is that the IgE tends to go down, the marginal IgE, the higher the family income, but more in affluent families have lower IgEs, but in terms of the CORAC curve, higher alphas. So there's a negative relationship in Denmark, and we do this at the county level between alpha and beta. And so what we find is that sorting plays a very powerful role. That's not my only evidence on sorting, by the way. Sorting implies strong family income gradients on child outcomes. And what we also find is sorting by teachers into more advantaged districts. Remember, the pay is the same. So nobody's getting any more money by working in one district or another district. But nonetheless, they're sorting. And more educated, more qualified teachers are sorting in the neighborhoods with more affluent and educated parents. And so there is a sorting on the basis of the quality of uh, the child. And this is an old point too, again, that if you can't pay teachers in money, you can at least pay them in terms of the quality of the students they teach, or which makes their job much easier and maybe even brings pleasure. So what do you wanna, Jim, go Jim, ahead. I have, a, I have a question to you. Did you look at immigration, like people who came from Syria and Romania and Poland? It's a Denmark, small group. That... It's a small group. Yeah. I mean, we have what? looked at the, the group of North Africans that have, first of all, there's a large Turkish, there's a fairly, well, large, I mean, the whole country, the whole point country point is percent. smaller than Cook County uh, in terms of population in Chicago, oh. but nonetheless, one, there is a small population in, of, of Turks that have not assimilated quite as well as the rest. The Arab population, however, the recent immigrants, I have not looked at that. The data are too recent, because remember, we're trying to look at father-son relationship. And so they're only recent immigrants, but they are definitely do, not doing well. They're a major source of inequality within Denmark. And in fact, they're segregated. There's a lot of hostility, anti-Islamic sentiment that goes into, uh, it's going, it characterizes Denmark. Uh, recently, I found it fascinating actually that uh, when I was, I've gone to Denmark quite a bit working with uh, Rasmus and a group in our house as well. And what we found talking to a minister, several ministers there who are cabinet ministers who are, is a very strong sentiment against Islamic populations on the grounds they're not going to assimilate. And so what they've done is that they, in an effort to try to exclude these people, and in certain neighborhoods, they are requiring that children growing up in certain neighborhoods, call them ghetto neighborhoods if you want, Arabic neighborhoods, they must send their children to preschool. Why? Because that will teach them Danish. The immigrants are entering schools right now, the children entering schools, knowing only Arabic and not really be able to function. They, they start behind and they never catch up. So the assimilation question and the immigrant issue is huge there, but it's, uh, it's very controversial and we don't have enough data to really pursue it. And the, the Turks who came before back in the 60s, they're doing pretty well. They're not doing as well, but nonetheless, the, the, the heritability of inequality is higher. The beta is much higher in the Turkish subpopulations, but it's a small, small sample. So, so let me give you numbers. Uh, there are 1.1% uh, Turkish in Denmark and there are 5.5% Muslim in Denmark. Uh-huh, that makes so, sense. But uh, the, the, the Muslim population is much more recent. Well, I mean, the ones, the Muslims that aren't Turks, I should say. Yes, the question is, you can find out maybe what, the, what was the income in Romania, Syria, Poland, and so on and so on, father income. And then I could, can... no, we haven't done that. That's a different task and we don't have data directly that allow us to do that. By the way, I should discuss the data that we have. We have registered data for Denmark. And this is amazing data in the sense that we literally can follow a person from birth to death. We literally know where the person was born. We know the schools. We know every neighborhood the person lived in. We know exactly the income of the parents at each stage of life. We know uh, schools. We know the peers of these people in schools. We know which schools they go to, where they work. We know what their 
uh, test scores are. We know what the teacher's test scores are. This is, this is registered data. And we also have supplementary surveys. So we have data on the structure of things like, uh, uh, you know, non-cognitive social and emotional skills for subsamples. And we'll use those in it later when I get to uh, uh, intergenerational, wealth-based intergenerational uh, elasticity measures. So, but yes, I could do that, but we haven't done that. So it's a good idea. Did you divide it to like billionaires or very people at the top 10% or something? Well, I'll show you, there is a nonlinearity there. Yeah. We can't identify individuals. And uh, so I never really researched, we can't publicly identify billionaires. There aren't that many. So there is a confidentiality requirement. Everything has to be anonymized. So in that sense, I can't point out that uh, Jens Anderson has making a hundred million dollars last year or a hundred million kroner, uh, that's not possible. But we can go and we do find strong nonlinearities in the IGE, I'll, I'll come to that. Okay, so what's the argument? So what we argue is a central premise of the welfare state, and this is really featured by Max Weber and I think has been the rule in many welfare states, is equality of access is mandated by law. But equality in law does not imply equality in the use of services. Namely, the Matthew effect, which I already defined, we find arise because parents reinforce or substitute for public services delivered. They pick neighborhoods that offer better public services and they enforce the delivery of services. Just like in the US, there are school boards and parents do have their say in whether parent or children are doing any good. And a, and a paper by Carlson and Landerson, which I'll discuss, a very nice paper. It's an empirical paper. And it shows that, that the move in Danish welfare state from targeting the disadvantaged, that was the prevalent model in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. And they moved to universal access in the 50s, late 50s, 60s, 70s, that that actually had an effect in changing the educational IGE, namely that the appeal to universal access rather than just targeting disadvantaged people actually worked against promoting social mobility. Because again, the Matthew effect is at work. You have children, uh, uh, parents of children who are gonna take full use of those universal services and make sure they get the best teachers. It also is a case that a free housing market which Denmark has, very little public housing per se. Uh, sorting is large and increasing. We know there are strong peer effects and also additional effects that come in congregating parents together who have similar values and similar interests in what the schools are teaching the children. And so I would argue, and we wanna show you that sorting by parental income plays a powerful role, both in the US and in Denmark. And the choice of a neighborhood of residents to raise children has a powerful role in explaining intergenerational inequality. And that's been ignored, I think, in a lot of recent work. Uh, people talk about, you know, the zip code is destiny, but it's not just that. It's really much deeper in the sense of how the parents, how the environment. So it's more than just a, a place, somehow abstract notion of a place. It's what goes on in the place and who's sorted there that plays a big role. And so what I would argue is that beta, the kind that Miles has focused on, is focused mainly on beta across countries. And yet in Denmark, we're able, because of much better, better data, to look at neighborhoods. We can go very fine in neighborhoods. We can go down to what I call parishes. The, the country is still organized around the Lutheran church parish, some established many centuries ago but you have data by municipality. We can do this many different ways and we find some regularities. And so we're looking at both the alpha in and the beta in by counties. Uh, uh, do you have housing prices as well? Oh yes, no, we look at that. I'll talk about that. Yes, and neighborhood prices give us a way to measure how much people are willing to pay for the quality of the school they get. And so we pursued that line, I'll, I'll discuss that. But that is one measure of the welfare state. When people talk about the welfare state, they're talking 
usually about health, usually they're talking about one item or the other, or a broad package. Here, what we're talking about is a range, uh, including the, the value of public services. But it, how do you value the public services provided? That should be part of an inclusive measure of, energy, of, of income this, this year and the IGEs across generations. So yes, I'll talk about that in a minute, uh, in a few minutes, I should say. So this purpose of selection makes a difference. So what can we do? We also have access to register data. And so what we wanna consider is what income concept should we use? Does it matter? What happens when we look at consumption inequality? We can look at that. What happens when we look at average income around 35 in that kind of traditional Korakian regression? Uh, and correct, correct me. So I feel very safe in referring to it now because he can correct me as he already has and I appreciate it very much. But we also wanna look at things like inheritability or, or IGEs measured in terms of value functions that incorporate things like uncertainty connected with the welfare state, reducing, putting in a safety net, uh, leisure and credit constraints. So we do definitely wanna consider lifetime measures, including the obvious measure, which we think is important too, turns out to be more important than we thought, just discounted family income. And it turns out that item five under 10, the, green, uh, the, the, the orange five under the green 10, is the most powerful predictor of child outcomes in our data. And so what we find is that if we look at the IGE based on the PDV, the present discounted family income, uh, it's much higher than the traditional measure. And that, that starts to answer a question that was posed earlier. So let me just make a few obvious points. I don't think I have to waste time with this group as sophisticated as it is. But what we know is that Denmark has a very, very generous public sector. And in terms of expenditures on pre-primary education, Denmark, uh, as a percentage of GDP, has a much more activity. Uh, public activity for sure, total activity for, for sure as well. Uh, if you look at uh, primary, secondary, and post-secondary uh, non-tertiary spending, you do see Nonetheless, that Denmark is active and is more active than the US. Of course, the private sector is always a little bigger in the US, public sector much bigger. And so if you look at trends in daycare use, uh, there is daycare use, this is any kind of daycare. This isn't quality daycare, this is just daycare. And if you look at trends in preschool participation um, in Denmark, you can see it's, it's high and rising. It's very high, close to 100%. And there's a very informed quality. Daycare workers are paid at the rate of school teachers and are very highly trained compared to school teachers. So there really is, there isn't the kind of informal market that is preschool and, uh, and daycare in the US. Um, if we look, for example, about inequality, what we see is if we look at inexpen expenditures per student and we look at the public schools, what we see is in Denmark, it's much more concentrated, okay, around the mean. In the US, as we know, there are enormous variations in public school expenditures per students. Uh, this is adjusting too for cost of living. So there are substantial differences that remain. And we look at expenditures, state pre-K, municipal daycares. We have huge dispersions in Denmark uh, but also enormous dispersions in the U.S. in terms of state pre-K. That's an emerging sector in the U.S., been cut back recently for, for obvious reasons. So what do we know about educational mobility? So if I just fit the IGE, again, using the same kind of framework, Gini coefficient, so again, Corax graph, but now looking at the IGE for schooling, schooling of the parent, schooling on the, uh, the children. What we find is that coefficient is about the same in US as in Denmark, maybe a little lower in the US. So it's a, it's, it's, there's a very high, uh, a very high degree of mobility or relatively high degree of mobility in the US, much lower in UK, uh, much higher in Israel. So you can see the IGEs for, for, and this is something we're interested in, why? 
Why? And part of it has to do with that educational reform I mentioned before. But this is something that people find very disturbing. And I would say people in Denmark find very disturbing. Uh, we mentioned this to some cabinet ministers who came to our talks in Arvas a few years ago, and they were troubled by this. This is a graph on the left-hand side, is a graph that Belly and Lochner, uh, Lance Lochner, who's at the University of Western Ontario. If you look, uh, there's a graph. Uh, Carnero and I had an earlier graph, but Lochner in, in enhanced it and, and updated it. And what you see is uh, across ability quartiles, uh, one quartile one quart. So here ability is measured by the armed forces qualifying test that's in the NLSY. Within them, you'll see a gradient. And the gradient for high school completion is by income. As you go left to right from purple to the light blue, you're moving up in family income. And so you'll see significant differences even among ability groups. Certainly among the low ability groups, uh, low ability groups in particular, having a smart parent, sorry, a rich parent makes a lot of difference. But the gradient is there for all except the most able. Similar gradients appear in Denmark. And many people who are in the Danish political uh, scenery found this to be very, very troubling. And it has created a, an issue about whether, how equal Denmark really is. So here's an example. This is the IGE, nonlinearity in the IGE that I was talking about. So if I look at something like height, this isn't the, this is an IGE estimate, but what it is, it's looking at high school completion. So I was looking at the father and the, the son complete. And so we're graphing that against income. And what we can see, family income now, that's parental income, family income. And what we can see is that there is pretty high, it's a number is around 0.3 for this IGE. And uh, uh, the range of estimates is somewhere over down to 0.15 or so, I guess. And you can see that the IGE actually declines marginally. And you get a similar comparison in the US. So what's happening is that more educated parents, the IGE among more educated parents, among more affluent parents, excuse me, is declining uh, and for both US and Denmark. And if you look at college completion, what we see is in Denmark, there is a very strong IGE. So the higher the level of parental income, the higher the probability of uh, transferring and having more education in your parent. College completion uh, in the US has a similar slope as well. So the US and Denmark by these measures look a lot more similar. And here I'll show you something that's staggering for many people. Now, I feature this in some of my work on early childhood, and but this is something that I think is very important and many people have worked on these kinds of data. What we've seen, for example, is for, if we look at the US, what we can see is that the mother's education plays a very big role. Um, uh, green, <laughs> the grid, this is kind of a test of your IQ, I guess. The grid is not uh, properly colored, but nonetheless, the green is college educated mothers and the red is high school and the blue is basically uh, less than high school, high school dropouts. And so what you see is very sharp gradients in birth weight in the US. If you look at some measure of non-cognitive skills, so a so-called sociability score, there are also big gaps. If you look at reading comprehension score, starting at age eight and going over 14, the gaps are there as well with the, the green is uh, uh, college educated mothers, children with college educated mothers and so forth. If you look at crime at age 25, we can see that close to 90% of the children who have college educated mothers are essentially no, have no crime, but that falls. And to a high school graduate mother, it's down to about uh, 70.77. And if you look at years of schooling, there are substantial gaps. And if you look at wage earnings at age 40, there are substantial gaps. And what are the Danish counterparts? So that's the US data. When we do the same thing, look, birth weight, similar gaps, 
not admitted as a neonatal ward. Assess skills, similar gaps, reading scores, criminal convictions. This is Denmark now. So we're getting gaps that are very comparable to those gaps in the US. And this is despite the fact there's universal education access, despite the fact that there is universal pre-K, despite the fact that there is a lot of uh, public service made available that are not available in the US and uh, no tuition, no tuition for college. So the free college tuition issue is less important. And if we go out later in life in Denmark, uh, we can see that uh, more people are ill by measuring use of hospital. But if you look at the labor force, use, use of medical services, which is available to all, by the way, uh, if you look at the labor force, you can see that many more college children of college educated mothers are in the labor force and active compared to those with high school dropouts. And if you look at one measure, which is how many are alive, a measure of mortality, there's substantial gap uh, at, at age 60 already. And it actually continues into the later years. And if you look, for example, at uh, language test scores by mother's education, what you see is again, the green being high, that there are substantial gaps uh, by uh, mother's education. So a real question is, wait a minute, we have a welfare state that is, nobody ever said it was heaven, but nobody really in Denmark realized how many gaps there were. And although I didn't put them side by side, they do compare side by side. It's not like I'm, sh I'm shrinking the scale in, um, in, uh, uh, in the US to make it comparable to Denmark. The scales are comparable. So why do these gaps arise? It's a good question. Yes, uh, yes. Sorry to interrupt. Um, what were the years for those graphs? The years I mean, for the graphs were years, it varied a little bit, but these graphs are in the late uh, uh, teens. So we're looking at some of the latest data. So for example, what we follow is individuals over time. Some of these, remember we have cohort data. So we'll get some of these early cohorts born say back in 1960 and 70, and then we'll follow them years but we also look at cross sections at a point in time. These are the panel data sets. In terms of uh, policy changes over those periods, I mean, could that be attributable to some it of- It could be, yes, okay. that's a legitimate question. And you know, there definitely could be cohort effects here at work that uh, produce these gaps. But nonetheless, these, these same would be true here in the US, of course, and uh, we're measuring it in a comparable dimension. So, uh, uh, you know what, actually I made a mistake. I made a big mistake and I don't wanna bullshit you here. So I did what I've said before was wrong to be precise. These are measures from data. So this is from kind of opportunistic surveys, okay? And so these are measured as of the time. So the CNLSY is measured when it starts being collected in 1980. So those are the kind of data we can get uh, from the CNLSY and that's going to be uh, following kids into the 80s and early 90s. Uh, 25 year out criminal conviction is gonna be later. So there could be more or less enforcement of criminal activity. So you're absolutely right. These have a problem that there could be cohort effects that are at work here. And that some of the changes in policy that I documented are built into these figures. And so uh, one needs to correct for that. And these figures don't, so sorry. I, I, we do have data too that follow cohorts, but as I realized, and so I, that's why I corrected myself, we actually, um, we get comparable gaps, but uh, not as long a series. We don't follow very many people all 60 years. So I apologize for that, but you're absolutely right. It could be, some of this could be driven by the institutions uh, changing. Although I don't see dramatic change in educational institutions, for example, um, uh, in, Denmark, uh, there's been an expansion of the system that came true in the 1950s and 60s. And that and these people in these graphs would be 30 years old, probably around 2000, 2010 or so. I, I have to be careful. I can go back and answer. I should, that's a good question. Yeah, go ahead. Jim, do you know if they're using private teachers, private tutors? Not often, not much, no. Not much. I mean, there are some private schools there, yes. 
No, no, but, yeah. just adding, adding to the education. Like in Israel, it's very well known that people go to a teacher of mathematics, teacher of English, in addition to what the school provides. Oh, yeah, no, that's true in a lot of countries in Asia and so forth, but this is much less prevalent here. I think what you do find, however, is that the, um, and you don't find, I thought, I wondered how many Lutheran schools there might be or Catholic schools. And the, 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 sec, the, the sector is mostly secular. It's really very small church presence in these. Uh, so I think it's, these are mostly public schools that we're going to, we're talking about. Okay. Okay, so the question is, why do these gaps arise? And so what I want to argue is that the greater income mobility in Denmark is largely due to the high progressive tax transfer system, and not because of a higher level of production of human capital. And that's a, a central theme of this talk. So what do we do? Now, this is using our data. And the, the group that we're looking at is child income on parents income for cohorts born 73 to 75, we're analyzing different cohorts, okay? So 73 to 75, they're born in that period. We obviously can follow their parents and we follow them into adulthood. And so what, if we look at some version of uh, the Korakian IGE here, what we can find is that um, if we look at a measure of gross income, which excludes any transfer, this is just what you earn, before taxes and transfers, you're gonna find that the IGE is basically the difference between the US and Denmark. That's what this is now. It's not the absolute level of the IGE, it's the difference between US IGE minus Danish. It's actually very, very small, uh, even favoring Denmark, I guess. So what we actually have is, if we look at gross income that includes transfers, then the beta rises. So there is more. So, so now I'm decomposing for a particular cohort the sources of why the IGE is different. For income now, I'm going back to income. We look at wage earnings alone, just wage earnings, there's already a substantial difference. Tax and transfer system. If I put in wage earnings and tax and transfer, the US difference is, is enormous. So what I'm saying here is that the welfare state in its tax and transfer policy, would actually work towards reducing the structure of, uh, of uh, inequality uh, in Denmark. And that's a major contributor. And then of course, the question is, are there any negative aspects to this? And we'll come to that in a bit. So you can see that, in, that if we just compare US-Denmark across income levels, and of course, it's always troublesome to say, oh, do we really have the right income measure. We attempted to try to take measures of income parity across, across. So take this as you will. What we find is that only do we find differences at the very highest level of parental income. And this again is US minus Denmark. But we do find that basically over a substantial income range, they're not really all that different. And just in a small neighborhood, are they? And then at higher income levels, there just aren't enough data to actually make the comparison valid. Uh, same thing is true, but now if you look at post, this is now market income. This is what you earn, wages. If you look at post-transfer income, then you start seeing IGE differences. And that's where the transfer policy is more egalitarian and is actually producing that lower IGE. So we want to argue that the lower income inequality and in social mobility is not necessarily skills-based. And it's really tax and transfer system-based inequality. So when we can put these two side by side, when I look at the income IGE and the college attendance IGE, what we find is very similar on the right. So this is again, US minus Denmark. So if you look at those, you can see a big difference uh, growing and when you factor in income transfer policy, but very little uh, difference. When you look at things like, uh, uh, when you control in various ways between college of the parent and college of the child. And so it's really substantial difference. So what are, so that's kind of exhibit A. Exhibit B is basically sorting. 
which we think is a powerful role and hasn't received proper attention. And here I'm not just saying, you know, I'm not just, I'm, I'm not saying some property is a magical property of a neighborhood. I'm talking about a property of, of, uh, of something really basic, which is the family structure and the quality of the neighborhood. And so public expenditure is equalized. Remember your access to hospitals, your access to, to, uh, to, to any public service is equal. If you have a need, you go. Uh, and you can go to college, but you have to qualify, which means you've got to pass the test. So what I can argue is what is the source of these? Home investments matter, but the choice of neighborhoods, peers and public goods also matter. And I wanna argue that the element of choice of neighborhoods has been neglected in the recent literature. And so I would argue that the way neighborhood effects have been treated in the press, particularly the New York Times Atlas of Opportunity, I think really distorts what's really going on in understanding. So here is the great Gatsby curve in terms of upward mobility uh, in the, within the US. And so what I wanna argue, this is now within US across different neighborhoods. And so what we're doing is getting census tracts. This is Chetty's uh, data and I'm using this. You can see this strong relationship that the uh, upward mobility uh, coefficient, which is lower, uh, in uh, where inequality is higher. And uh, that is, this is our version of it, but instead of looking at uh, US, this is our version of it across municipalities in uh, Denmark. And again, this upward mobility declines the more uh, the parents are affluent. And this is uh, gross income excluding transfers. So what do we know about sorting and segregation? Well, there's a lot of work about this. People like Reardon and Bischoff and many people have written about this and it, it's a factor. It's, it's built in to the discussion, but it's only part of the discussion. And so what I want to do is show you some data from the U.S. and the comparables in, in, in Denmark. So if you look at this pattern, this uh, pattern, which is using this tile coefficient, H of T is a measure of, uh, of sorting. So the higher H of P is, the more uniform neighborhoods are, the more, the more people are alike. And what you see is if you look at the income distribution at the bottom of the distribution, you go to the top, people are sorted much more heavily than in the middle. So in the middle income distribution, and we can also see that this pattern has been increasing over the time period, 1970, 1980, 1990, and so forth. So you're getting a rise in the sorting over time. If you look, for example, in Denmark and looking again, we have uh, not exactly the same years, but we have comparable years. We're looking at this tile index again. And what you'll see is going from 76 to 2013, the same kind of general shape, U shape and rising. So the segregation uh, sorting phenomenon is increasing. Uh, over time, also in Denmark, free market, so total free market housing. And you get strong socioeconomic gradients in neighborhood quality. And so high school completion and college attendance, very strong sorting. Uh, if you look, for example, uh, across uh, different uh, neighborhoods, college attendance, and uh, uh, you look at the high school graduation, very, very strong. So family income, in grade nine is of the peers. Now this is a characteristic of the neighborhood, it plays a very powerful role. And then we can go forward and say, look, what is the uh, average grade completed of the parents? So does, not necessarily relying on income, doing this sorting by grades, very strong, very strong sorting. And if we look, for example, uh, at the fraction of mothers who smoke during pregnancy, we know that's a threat to health. This is in Denmark again. And this is excluding the immigrants, by the way. It's getting, quote, native Danes. And what we're doing is we're getting a very strong relationship, uh, again, by household learnings. And you get the same kind of strong relationship by education. So you're getting very a lot of sorting going on. Maybe that's not surprising, but we know that those sorting effects can be substantial in terms of producing child quality and producing quality schools. 
So what do we know about teacher quality? Well, given the teachers are paid all the same, you might think they are roughly the same. This is giving you a statement of how the hourly wages by in different neighborhoods vary. This is what the density at the plot is showing you. But the line is basically the high school grade point average of the teachers in living and working in those districts, okay? And what you're finding is that the teachers hourly wage distribution, this is the, you know, related to GPA. It's, uh, there's some, some gradient there. But there are a lot of teachers that sort and we have measures of college sorting and what's teachers did in college. Non-price allocation at work, sorting by student quality. And this is a non-price mechanism where best teachers are sorted to the best neighborhoods. And uh, here, this is probably more revealing. If we look at the average years of parent schooling and we graph that, this is again in these municipal neighborhoods, we have very fine detail. And we can also do these plots and do these plots in even finer details, counties, very, very small geographic neighborhoods. We can actually isolate small, what we would call census tracts or blocks and do things like this. But nonetheless, if we look at school, we can see a positive and statistically significant association, although there's a lot of variation around the, around the line in terms of the parents' quality and the average teacher quality uh, measured by their test scores in school. And what we see is, uh, again, this goes back to Yohanan's uh, point earlier, if we look at the average teacher quality in schools and parents' education by housing values, we do find that the average teacher quality goes up uh, with the average uh, house value. So it's very much sorting, even though they're paid all the same. So another role for parental influence is parents may also reinforce school quality or substitute away from it. It's a big, big, big issue in the literature. Only a few papers. Uh, there's a, Eisen and Gelber have a paper. There are a number of other papers. Uh, there's a new paper by uh, my co-author that I'm going to draw on, which actually suggests, uh, which is for Denmark, which is then highly relevant for this paper. But the question is, if you raise quality of school, are you, are you stimulating parental participation? Are they act more actively engaged in the schooling? or are they less actively engaged? That's a question. And uh, what we actually find is that equal access downstream does not mean equal skill formation upstream. More advantaged children enter schools with greater skill. That's the benefit of family. Early childhood gaps are there when children enter school. And we saw some of those gaps by, by parental education, mother's education in particular. And so there are two barriers for education that are discussed a lot in the US, parental cost of schools and parental skills. There's no charge, no tuition charge in Denmark for any of these schools, secondary, college, and so forth. And, uh, but parental skills still remain. And therefore we could argue, well, we at least in a crude way, we put to the side the issue about tuition and some of the schooling costs that have dominated discussions in the US discussion. So the real question is how do parents respond to public investments? Do they adjust or reinforce their own investments? Uh, do they reinforce or substitute is the question. And so we built a model, Genshowski and Landerso build a model in which they estimate the marginal rate of technical substitution between the home and institutions. They look at the production function for skills looking at home production functions, and they look at home production, and they look at school production function. And what they find, sorry, I jumped, I, I just gonna summarize it verbally. They estimate this, I have a structural model of educational production. It's a model pattern somewhat after my own previous work with Cunha uh, and, and work by people like Flynn and Balboca and Wiswall and others. What we find is that on net, parents substitute in the presence of better quality schools. So, in the part of parental response, that's a factor that actually is helping to contribute for why 
they're, even though the investment's about the same and they're sorting, that the effects aren't as strong in Denmark. In other words, this is a force towards equality uh, in, in Denmark. So what I showed you was that in fact, there was a lot of sorting going on. And indeed the educations weren't all that different. The quality level was high in Denmark. I didn't show you on an absolute scale, but there's a large, very large expenditure on public sector. So this is a very big component and it's huge and it has a huge uh, effect. And so what I also, and here I'll talk about this uh, public policy shift in a minute. <coughs> The nature of the Danish welfare state changed in the 1960s. Educational mobility started peaking in the 1960s. You know, the problem with uh, measurements taken on people who lived through the depression and their children is you're bound to get a lot of mobility. I mean, if your income is zero or very low and then the whole economy picks up, it's no surprise. And back in that Chetty graph, you can see the 1940 cohort exhibited exactly what I'm talking about, that the children do better because they live in a better economy, even if there's no real increase in skill. But what happened in Denmark was more, more easily interpreted and maybe better understood. There was a massive expansion of public education at the bottom. So the social welfare state of the day was really targeting cohorts that were disadvantaged and that produced high level of mobility. These are children born in rural areas, children of farmers. They started going to school at a very high rate. And then what happened is that the expansion in college and university, which went further in the 1970s. So there was a universal, there was a general universal expansion in coverage that that actually was driven by expansion from the more affluent families. So the targeting changed and the level of mobility changed as well. That led to lower social mobility. That's again, the Matthew effect. Again, you target, you provide general, you provide general access and the more advantage, take advantage of it. This is, you know, uh, some, some recent work by Klein and Walters and by Walters himself shows that even in charter school, the people who benefit the most in the US, the people who benefit the most from the charter school. Remember, there's always an eligibility for the charter schools uh, in terms of family income, at least in her, their studies. But literally in those studies that the ones who benefit them, who will benefit the most are the least advantaged. And the ones who use the service the most are the most advantaged within the income uh, category phenomena. So there's a really, an interesting, uh, I think a universal phenomena where family response plays a major role. Plato talked about this in the Republic, and here we have it right in front of us. So the Weberian welfare state has a downside to it. So this is an example of the correlation uh, between, this is the educational IGE. And in that period, 45, in the, in, the, in the early period, what you find the IGE went up tremendously, it was very high in Denmark before 1945. You know, the, during, before the war, the welfare state hadn't really taken off much. But then the policy was targeted in the mid 40s. And what you found is a dramatic reduction in the IGE. And then as universality increased, the IGE crept up. And so there, this is the correlation, uh, upward mobility and parents' education. And so what you're getting then is a, uh, a pattern by year of birth that those cohorts that were targeted gained a lot relative to the other cohorts. And the universal, well, they actually showed. And, and what you're getting then in the later cohorts is the American and the Danish IGEs are basically the same for different birth cohorts. This is now taking a spectrum of birth cohorts back to 1911 and 1921. So we can see substantial uh, comparison. So Dan Denmark mobility was much lower. Welfare state comes in, dramatic effects. But now, 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 what you see is that in fact Danish immobility is increasing. But for a while, it went down as a result of the targeted policy. So compulsory schooling reforms increase educational mobility. Universality helps children from better backgrounds relatively more. 
And so what we found, and this is a finding in many studies, a uh, paper, uh, I wrote a survey uh, with uh, several students, Elango uh, published a book that uh, Robert Moffat ed edit edited a few years ago on social welfare programs. And what we found is that the early childhood interventions are the most effective for the disadvantaged. Klein and Walters find the same thing. Charter School, Obnes and Mogstead, Dustman. So every study that I can find shows that the disadvantaged benefit. There's some claim about universality is really good. Maybe, but honestly, there is this sorting that goes on. And I think the other part is just kind of a political argument that if you target a program, you stigmatize it. So what about neighborhood effects? I don't know if I'm going too long here. I'm not, I've been talking for close to an hour here, but, but let me talk about it, neighborhood effects because this is what we started talking about and then kind of went away. So we can actually talk. Uh, uh, the uh, structure is looking at the child and these are in neighborhoods, very narrowly defined neighborhoods. These would be parishes, and we get similar patterns, by the way, the IGE. And so what we're getting is parishes in these particular studies. And we have basically about 2,500 residents in these parishes. We are able to go smaller, but obviously we're going to find ourselves uh, much weaker. What we find is that children, assigned children to the parish, they spend the longest time. That's, so there's a question of what parish did the child live in? We have some new studies where we actually are following the exposures, but surprisingly, a lot of the families are stable. So we, we're looking at children who uh, stay in a neighborhood with a certain kind of uh, uh, quality. Uh, and we look at the longest exposure. And we look at a long run income, some average between ages 30 and 45. And we look at market income labor incomes and capital income. And we can see and we'll know, uh, and I'll show you in a bit, uh, what happens if we use other measures of income. So we have registered data and we have very detailed registered data. And so if you look at this across parishes, this is the distribution of market income IGE. This is without tax and transfer, this is straight market income. And there we saw that US and Denmark are somewhat, but now what you can see is the IGE, there's a lot of dispersion uh, and it, it's constant. Uh, what happens is that if you redistribute, namely if you add back in the, the welfare state, that's what I mean by this slide, redistribution greatly reduces beta hat IGE. But what you're doing is you're shifting that and you're shifting it more towards zero. So the redistribution, these are the same IGEs, but fit with different measures. One is the present discounted value of income, which is on the right there, on the left, sorry. And then you can see transfers add in. So what, what I'm doing is I'm just shifting the curve, uh, which is initially the excluding transfer curve and changing it by including transfers and taxes and present discounted value of taxes and transfers. So that shifts towards egalitarian, but there's still a big distribution even across parishes. So variation appears to increase from more granular neighborhoods. So uh, could be sampling error, so you can't make a lot out of it. And in fact, many of you may have seen this paper by Mogstad that looked at some study by Chetty in the US and Seattle and found that the so-called zip code effects that he was reporting were not statistically significant between the bottom and the top the zip code. So the zip code effects were just an artifact. Uh, they were not statistically significant and they were, trans they were an artifact. I'll come in to that question in a minute. Uh, uh, come back to that question. Okay, so I'm gonna look at market income before taxes and transfers as a measure of child and parent income. We think of market income as kind of earnings potential. So we're, how, what's the transfer of earnings potential across generations? So one thing we find when we do this is there's enormous amount of sampling here. This is not properly recognized. Then we look at the variance of beta across neighborhood. 65% of the variation in alpha N uh, and beta N is due to sampling error. So if you look at the variability in those plots, it's because of sampling. Uh, 
And uh, Mogstad 2020 has its own version of this in the Seattle reanalysis. So 60% of the variance, even in statistically significant estimates among N is due to sampling error. And so when we look at what the contribution of neighborhoods to inequality would be, what we see is the between neighborhoods, this notion that zip code is destiny is not important, at least in Denmark. About only about 10% of the variability in adult child income, uh, I mean, the income of the children as adults uh, is explained by uh, the neighborhood. And the within neighborhood variation is explained about 90%. So it's really going, what's going on, yes, in the neighborhood, but it's not just neighborhood per se. And so we can regress this, we can do uh, what sociologists might call, well, it's a random coefficient model and we, we can relate it. And so what we see is we look at intercept versus mean income, we can see you get a higher and higher intercept in neighborhoods where intercepts now, these are the alphas in neighborhoods with parental income. So that's going up, but beta is going down. And that's a consequence of this nonlinearity I showed you. So if you think about this nonlinear function, the nonlinear function is going down. So if I fit a linear function through it uh, and just I coraquify it, if you uh, will permit me that term, I'm gonna get this relationship that the alpha and the beta are negatively related and which is the proper measure. So if we look at what are the determinants of those neighborhood IGEs and we look at individual estimates, <coughs> we can see that if we look at the neighborhood, we can see that school quality plays an important role and the standard error significantly reduces the IGE. So there's definitely pro IG. So anything to the left of the red line is pro IG. Anything to the right is anti IG. And there we can see, for example, if parents committed a crime, very strong effects. I should point out, by the way, that the Chetty data does not permit him to know whether or not the parents committed crime. It's known to be a major factor. Whether the parents are hospitalized, and then to get back to the point you kind of raised, the pr pr proportion of Muslim immigrants definitely goes against international, intergenerational mobility for these parish neighborhoods, but it's barely statistically significant, really isn't at a, at a standard level of 5%. So what you're finding is, you know, mother plays a role, father plays a role, but a lot of the variation is on some of these family influence effects and maybe school quality, which I tried to convince you earlier, was partly a matter of school, of parental goal. So here's the, here's the issue I've been harping on repeatedly, that literally the fit of the IGE, uh, parent income and child income, is highly nonlinear, okay? And so if we look at the neighborhood IGE, so that's for the whole country IGE, the one on top with a very big standard error bar at the high income levels because there's not that many high income people. If you look at the bottom uh, graph, that's for the neighborhood level IGE. Otherwise estimates get too noisy and you get the same general curvature. And you can see if I linearize it, I'm gonna have alpha negatively correlated with beta. So beta decreases as mean parental income increases. And I, this gets right back to the question of what is the proper measure of intergenerational transmission? What's the proper measure of mobility? Try to come back to that in a minute. But what we can find, if you look at the slope coefficients uh, uh, of, uh, uh, sorry, yeah, this is on alpha. I got this out of order. But what we can see is that school quality has a big effect on the intercept, the initial conditions, percentage of intact families in the, in the neighborhood. And again, crime plays a very negative role and Islamic immigrants are gonna face a much lower intercept. So they start with a lower intercept and uh, then they have basically a higher curve. That's the, the IGE. So there is purpose of choice to raise children. See, one of the identifying strategies used in a lot of recent work is that uh, neighborhoods are basically more or less randomly assigned. Uh, and what we find is that families move to new firms. What we find, uh, I won't go through all these graphs because I am running out of time. In fact, maybe I've run out of time. So, uh, but I do want to show you one other thing. So what I'll argue is that basically there's a lot of 
The idea that families are somehow moving at random within the life of the child is just nonsense. What's happening is that families move purposely before the birth of the first child and somewhat after the birth of the first child, much less after the birth of the, of the, of the first child into the second child and occasional third child. And so there's a lot of mobility choices are key to schools and that's very purposive. So the idea that somehow neighborhoods and school quality are randomly assigned is nuts. It just isn't, it is very strongly, uh, despite evidence of the contrary. So family moves are not random. And uh, so I'll, I'll skip all that. But here's an example of the household income level from time to birth of the firstborn. What you see is that mothers who are university educated are moving to higher and higher neighborhood levels. This is the average income of the neighborhood on the y-axis. And the less advantaged in terms of education are not moving at all, are not moving much. So there is a move towards advantage among those who get a college education, but there's a lot of mobility you can see in those early years. But if you go to the second born and the third born, more or less the family settled down. So most moves are made by young parents prior to the start of school. First born children experience moves more often than second borns. Highly educated mothers make fewer moves after arrival of children. Gaps in neighborhood college uh, quality remain and they persist during adolescence. So what did I wanna argue- Jim, just, Jim, Jim, did you look at age when the mother becomes pregnant or whatever, when she has- Yes, yes, I get the, actually it's the age when the family is born. I mean, when the family's formed. There's a period where they live together without making the investment in the house. Once the mother's pregnant, and we have other graphs that, do, that show this, but this is consistent with what you're saying. The mother getting, you'll notice that the graph starts rising in that period zero to five from the age of the child. So they are definitely settling down and making choices. So that's exactly right. They now have a family, they wanna equip the family and they're mostly altruistic and not looking for school quality. Now, did you look, I agree with you that you should look at the mother, but did you look also at the father? Yeah, but these, at the higher levels, they're highly sorted at university. At less than high school, they're not, they're also highly sorted. So I didn't show you educational sorting, but it's pretty substantial in Denmark. So I think this is a good proxy for the mother mm -hmm. and father. A lot of sorting, positive sorting is very high. Okay. So what I would argue is that uh, some of the strategies, now, one, I, I just wanna make a note in passing because I'm running out of time. Sorting can create artificial neighborhood effects if parental income is not well measured. And the trouble is that census-based, IRS-based measures are basically using very crude data. They don't really know. You don't have a full lifetime of the child. You only have certain years of the child. You don't even know what the income of the parents were in the earliest years. And you have to kind of fill in and you have to assume that families stay together. And you don't know whether the family, actually the parents were in prison, which we saw was a huge, huge effect in the Danish study. So there are a lot of issues that come that uh, neighborhood effects uh, may show up as an artifice. Let me, let me just go back to those of you who ever studied the permanent income hypothesis. If you remember, uh, one of uh, Friedman's many clever tests of the permanent income hypothesis was to sort people by neighborhoods and so forth. And, and so the idea was that because they're sorting or, or by occupation, but in this case here, what I wanna argue, we've shown that there's a lot of sorting going on, not perfect sorting, but a lot of sorting going on. And so if you measure income badly, and, and, and you do in the IRS, census data. You miss a lot of components of income and you also miss the timing of income. You only have it available in certain years and it's not, it's, it's a mismatch, let me put it that way. And so in, in some earlier work, which I can send you some commentary I had at Princeton on the Chetty uh, papers, uh, I actually go through and develop this in greater detail. But let me just give you an example. Suppose the underlying data generating process is the, second, is the first equation. 
And what I have is a, an equation. So these are the educational, these are the data generating processes. One is income of the child, income on the parent, measured over a long interval, and income of the parent and education of the parent uh, regress. So those, though, those are two different issues. And what I wanna argue is that gamma one is pretty big, a lot of sorting going on in terms of uh, education on the income of the parent. And so the income is measured with classical measurement error. So we do have classical measurement error, say. Good, actually, we know that income is not measured with classical measurement error. Uh, John Bound and his group have shown uh, and a lot of later work of people at Kentucky and others have shown there's a you know, non-response especially at the tails. You know, people underreport at the top, underreport at the bottom, and the measurement error is non-classical because of that and because of other reasons. And so suppose we do have just take it very simple and suppose individuals sort on neighborhoods and just indexed one to n, one to 10 here in this example. And so we, we choose cutoffs for each neighborhood. I, I, this is just a simulation to illustrate the point. So the question is, if income is measured with error and they're sorting on education, what is the estimate of delta N? What, when we regress and we estimate the Korak curve uh, with the intercept and slope and delta N is the perturbation from alpha naught, what do we identify when we do that? Well, clearly it depends on the neighbor and the measure, amount of measurement error. And so if the measurement error is actually zero, which is the dotted line, the dash, big dash line, I should say, uh, it centers around zero. If you look with a little bit of measurement error, it moves away and a lot of measurement. So what you're picking up is neighborhood effects that weren't even there. I created data where delta N is zero and, and implicitly also alpha N is zero, but I keep an alpha just for to make it traditional looking and use traditional values. And in this simulation, I find then that, the, that basically we're picking neighborhood effects up as a consequence of badly measured parental income. And there's no way that we can deny that, the, that, that using these kinds of census data for income and IRS census data actually is a good measure of family income. So we get a spurious neighborhood effect out of this. And so we, the probability of finding neighborhood effects is going to rise with the level of uh, uh, the level of measurement error. So if you have a high measurement error, and actually the data, at least in terms of uh, uh, the U.S. data and the estimates from Bound and uh, Brown and Mathewitz and, and later studies, suggest we're closer to the 0.5 than we are to zero for measurement error. So you can pick up spurious family income effects. And so this is the probability of finding spurious effects. So that you should be very, very careful. Let me conclude though with one thing here. Before, before you go on, Jim, let me ask you, uh, what about occupation? Like if your father is a medical doctor, the children will be medical doctors. Uh, so you can sort, you, can, you have data, so you can sort occupations in a border sense. I don't know exactly what, but- No, no you could. No, that's a good point. And we know that people learn you know, the, the children of jewelers are jewelers. The, right. the children yes. of dancers are dancers and actors. Diamonds, diamonds in Denmark. Diamonds, oh yeah, diamonds, a right. big industry. It's, you, learn right. it at the, you learn it at the breakfast table, I guess. But, uh, and think about politicians, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, John F. Kennedy apparently uh, learned his, uh, his politics, at least in part, by listening to Joseph Kennedy at the breakfast table. So no, there's no question that there's strong parental input. We haven't done that. And we could, that's that a good suggestion. In occupation, what you, uh, people will not lie. It's not like in the uh, income where they lie. Yeah, that's, no, that's, that's, a, that's a very good point. That's one, but, one question. The other question that I have is, maybe is, it's, is the policy is really endogenous. In our world, all of this equality and so on that we want as Danish to do, as long as we, the rich, who pays more for, uh, through our taxes, we should get better services. Well, be careful. I mean, remember, better services measured how? See, that's yeah. see, that's the question. Is the and this see, is something that we're deeply engaged in is trying to understand what, how should we value the local public good in computing the IGE? 
that's a measure of wealth that's not measured as income. And in Denmark, it's a huge chunk of wealth. I mean, it's a very active welfare state. There are a lot of state services provided and we have to monetize that. We have to, and we are in the middle of doing that using exactly those graphs on housing value and uh, mobility. So we actually have fit some models and are in the process. That's a separate paper all by itself, but that's a great idea, I think. So, okay, so let me, let me just, conclude with this. What is the proper measure of intergenerational transmission of utility? So Rasmus and I have been talking about this for the last few years and have really developed some ideas. So what we really want to think of is not the IGE uh, of just income on income, but a measure of lifetime welfare of both the father and the son, and then the children and the family. So we're moving much and more towards a family concept, the IG. How much is the family, the mother and father working, their assets, their, their abilities and so forth? How much does that map in to the welfare of the children? Separate IGEs for the welfare of the children. So we do some estimates of that. So I would argue, and Miles can please correct me if he hasn't left out of rage here. <laughs> uh, but the traditional literature on the IGE focuses on matching the income of the father to son over certain windows of age. What we're doing is looking at lifetime measures. And we are looking at uh, the first installment of a project, which is ongoing. I have some new work, and it's one of the reasons why I delayed uh, sending you the slides, uh, uh, because I have, uh, I have a, uh, we're still in the middle of doing this, and I don't have the latest results, but we have, we have some very, we have results now, much more on this. But literally, we do know that part of the intergenerational change that's occurred is the age of marriage and cohabitation change. So it's not a question of just aligning ages. There's the onset of fertility, namely that comes at different ages and more educated parents are generally having their children later, the timing and spacing of births and divorce. So those factors have changed across generations. And so allowing for that, we, we think something like a value function, some lifetime measure is far better than aligning incomes at specific ages or intervals of ages. So what we wanna do is we will include wage income, disposable income, income with and without tax transfers, consumption. We have a, lot, a number of different estimates and we will look at <coughs> human wealth, the value of human capital, expected PDV and permanent income, which would be some measure including capital assets and so forth. And we also have measures of consumption. There's a paper by Bruce, which we cite, uh, who talks a lot about consumption. Uh, there's a Danish expenditure and uh, Danish register data. Uh, and there are different ways to impute consumption, uh, which leads to big errors as documented by Bruce. So we actually have some real consumption data across generations. And, um, so we're gonna report consumption data as well. So literally one way to talk about intergenerational transfers is to draw on some recent work by my colleague, uh, Greg Kaplan and uh, his co-author Huggett that was published in the Review of Economic Dynamics. And what we do is we look at human wealth as measuring the asset value of income at a given age talk about human capital, but it's earnings of all sorts and capital. So it's a little bit misnomer. We call it human wealth measure. It's the wealth of the individual. MJK is the stochastic discount factor and DK is dividends at age K. And uh, this includes earnings and the value of leisure. And looking at measures of wealth and income, we're actually able then to estimate stochastic discount factors. So what we're doing, with this experiment, uh, there's a recent paper, for example, by, uh, by uh, uh, Linton and uh, uh, Lubell and a couple, I think Abbott maybe on that as well, um, which shows us how to measure MJK. So there are ways to estimate uh, dividend streams and dividends would include things like earnings as well. So I'm, I'm using a broad notion here of what a dividend is. They reward to, earnings or investment in human capital. But the method itself does not require that we take a position about whether 
there are perfect capital markets, nor do we have to do the traditional assumption about using, assuming perfect certainty. We're allowing for uncertainty of the income flows and we're allowing for the income equalizing effects of the transfer system. So we do then allow for social insurance to really be insurance and to essentially then uh, reduce the uncertainty, which reduces the value of the human asset. So what we do is basically we come up with a measure of the lifetime human capital or the value function. So we come up with a measure of this. So human wealth captures credit constraints for borrowing constrained agents. You may have a lot of future income, but it's not worth much to you. Uh, income uncertainty, risk aversion, and it's reduced even further by the fact, it, it, it accentuated even further by the inability to borrow. So we, cap, we put that into the model and we come up, come up with estimates of IGEs across generations. We also look at permanent income, which is just kind of the standard present discounted flow of income that we can get from this uh, data. So here is basically a, a set of measures of IGEs for Denmark. And what we're doing is parents at both individual father and family level. So we have a family IGE as a family resource. And we're computing then uh, either family income. So those are the double X's, the X's, and the diamonds are IGE family income, okay? So they're blue. And so what we're getting for different measures of income as you go across this figure, you can see that as I use permanent income, the wage income IGE is going up from about 0.25, consistent with that graph that I put up at the beginning, to a level that's over four uh, for the, uh, and the human wealth IGE is still close to 0.4. And so the measure matters. And then we get into a debate about what is the appropriate measure. I would argue things like permitted income or really the human wealth measure or value function measure is a good measure of how much the family is passing on to the next generation, a whole set of uh, resources, human capital and other things which are part of this uh, project. <coughs> so we then have a series here where we look at which measures are more predictive of child education measures. And it turns out, by the way, when you include assets and so forth, that the most predictive uh, is this permanent income measure, which is basically more traditional, not our human capital measure. And we go back to our, we go back, this is the graph I showed you earlier. This makes a real difference in terms of the dispersion. So the present discounted value measure, which is, and, and so our, our novelty here is really this measure of human wealth. And that is pretty predictive, but it's actually uh, the permanent income and asset together is giving us the best fit here. And uh, uh, although, you know, it's not expected PDV is the best, I guess, in this particular graph. If you look at the father's measure, if you look at the, if you look at the family measure of income, it's basically, oops, uh, some of the more traditional measures are pretty good actually in predicting, but it's a permanent income and the permanent income with assets. So in other words, coming up with a life cycle account is predicting better what child outcomes are gonna be. And it affects then the intercepts and the slopes, the distribution that appears within na across neighborhood types varies greatly. There's much more variability in using PDV in terms of the intercept estimates and uh, uh, the IGE estimates uh, also, yes. Jim, could you just summarize in a minute or two because I want sure. the student and the faculty to ask. No, questions. no, I understand. I want to get comments for sure. I'm really sorry about this. That's okay. Uh, going so long, but um, so I won't spend too much time on other questions, but literally <coughs> if we start looking at neighborhood effects here and we ask how much of the tile decomposition for the country of Denmark is due to within neighborhood variation and between neighborhood variation, we can see that much of it is within neighborhood. It is not much between neighborhood. It's not that some neighborhoods are, are marking people and life and so So there's enormous difference. Uh, uh, within neighborhoods are playing a big role 
especially for disposable income and the long-term measures, human wealth. Uh, and we get then, which we've already seen, segregation by source of income. And so if you look at the PDD measure, income uh, without tax, we're finding a lot of sorting going on in a percentage. Less sorting by PDD, but still uh, substantial sorting and the familiar U-shaped pattern. So what I would argue is that traditional measures of family resources show a stronger link than traditional measures. And the question is, what is the numerical value? I'm, I'm comparing two different coefficients. And I would argue that compar comparing utilities is not uh, uh, is probably a better idea, but it is, I think a measure of welfare is probably better. And I don't have good measures for the US on that so far. And we uh, compared to family income, family resources predict child outcomes. And I think lifetime measures paint a different picture of income mobility. Uh, it actually, if we look at mobility by just the absolute value of that coefficient, which is something we can debate, uh, it's lower in Denmark than we previously thought. So what I wanted to argue, and we have another paper in the Swedish Journal, the Scandinavian Journal of Economics, but basically, and we show some evidence of disincentive effects of some of these uh, progressive taxes that uh, go in, namely children dropping out of school when they are subsidized to get uh, subsidies to job training instead of uh, education. That literally uh, the Garden of Eden is there, but uh, it does have its flaws. And when we understand that, I think there's a much bigger role for parental choice and sorting that goes on. And it's really been neglected, I would argue, in in some of the recent work that's been heavily featured, not in all work, a lot of people, Reardon and others talked a lot about sorting and peer effects. So I don't want to uh, to, to disparage other work. So let me stop. Thank you okay, for your good. attention. Very good, thank you very much. Now, student, uh, why don't you go ahead? Hosting. Hi, Professor Hagman. Thank you for being part of our seminar today. So on behalf of my uh, fellow classmates, we have a few questions related to the topics that we've discussed today. Okay. And I, I think that overall, um, in, in the very wide literature of social mobility and inequality, there's some discussion of how uh, mobility is measured. So our question is, do you think that instead of measuring mobility with an income measure and using um, net worth or accumulated wealth of a household, would the results become more extreme in terms of inequality? Well, I mean, I showed you a little bit of that in the last part of the talk that uh, there appears to be a greater correlation uh, between uh, generations uh, when you use these life cycle measures than when you use the current measures. So that's consistent with what you're saying, I believe. Yes. And do you think there are, um, how challenged were you finding different metrics of data uh, between the United States and Denmark, meaning that there's, um, perhaps um, a comparison that's not being able, there, there's, there's something that is happening in Denmark that cannot be measured in the United States because of scarcity of data. That's not necessarily education or income or zip code. Do you think? Well, certainly I mentioned one already, I just gave an example. If you, one of the major findings in the literature uh, in terms of adolescent uh, achievement and uh, info, in family influence is that children whose parents go to prison, uh, in particular the father goes to prison, are much more likely themselves to go to prison. Uh, and that family structure is a very, very powerful role. The US data don't allow us to do that. Uh, we don't have that from the census or the IRS. Whether or not we know whether the person is in prison uh, at the time of the survey, but we don't know whether or not the family is uh, is uh, uh, wh whether or not the, 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 the father had been to prison before. Here we do know. And it turns out to be a very powerful predictor. So there are data in Denmark that we have that allow us to throw light on what's going on in the US and what the limitations are. We can compute in much greater detail these neighborhood effects and measures of income. And I didn't mention this, but parallel to the registered data that we have, we have some panel surveys that were taken uh, comparable to the CNLSY and to the NLSY uh, data in the US so that we can align measures 
So over certain intervals of time and for many variables that aren't in the standard registers, we can make meaningful comparisons. But yes, I think in general, the registered data are rich, but they're limited. And uh, we want more information about things like, we do have a measure of IQ because the children, the males anyway, are put into uh, programs in which they have uh, uh, army. They have to take an army qualifying test, a military qualifying test. So we can use that for males. So there are some ways to use the data, but it's, uh, it's really uh, richer data in Denmark. So there are some differences, yeah. But I'm not sure what your real question is there, though. That, that solves it. Thank you. OK. OK, Mice, go ahead. Well, thanks for that, Jim. It's uh, really a provocative talk. I, I'm familiar with the Scandinavian Journal paper, but I haven't, to be honest, kept up uh, with your more recent stuff. So it's really great to, to hear where you're going. Um, maybe with this Actually, short it'd be great talk. To, it'd be great to, to have a Zoom session uh, with the group, you, to find out where you're going and where your center is going. So it's reciprocal, my enthusiasm for Next you know, semester. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, maybe with the limited time that we have uh, available, can I ask you to step back to your original purpose, the way you introduced the paper, and give me or us a, a bit of a bigger picture uh, discussion here. Um, when students think of Jim Hepkin, Heckman and social mobility, they think, rightly or wrongly, uh, early years matter. Are we hearing in this paper it, that it's not just the early years that matter, that it's the ultimate institutions that determine equality of outcomes, like the income tax system, like the transfer system, like access to good jobs, like minimum wages? Do those outcomes play uh, a more than complementary role? Or another way of putting this, Okay, so President-elect Biden has um, got his economics team together. If you were in the White House, what would you be uh, telling him? What are the U.S. lessons from this Danish research is my question. Well, we know, I mean, this is something that I think, uh, we had Thomas, Thomas Piketty here a few years ago uh, in a big discussion. He and uh, Captain Murphy were pitted against each other and Durlock too, I should add. Uh, but uh, what came out loud and clear in the talk is of course these inter-country differences in inequality are in part drawn by institutions. So if we look at income inequality, and, and this is amazing to me that some of the local Chicago economists wouldn't admit it, but if you look at it, there's a massive redistribution going on in Scandinavia through the tax and transfer system. And that is reducing inequality in income. That's a fact. And that's a real thing. I guess when I, so, and, and I think denying that is some did, so it's crazy. And I, and I definitely don't think that all inequality is caused by the family. Although I do think the family and what goes on in the family plays a pretty powerful role. So I wasn't undercutting any of that, but you want me to step back. So let me step back first and then I'll try to get to your point here. Nice question. But the, the question, what, what I would argue is that when you look at this, to me, it was very interesting because I heard a lot of policies that people were saying, we need free college tuition. We need, we need to be able to pay to, to the same. There were a lot of reforms in education that have been put forward uh, that mimic what's going on in Denmark. And what I'm arguing is those may be very interesting. They were implemented in Denmark and they still create a lot of gaps between the children of the highly educated parents and the children of less educated parents. So the, a lot of the, so if Bernie Sanders were here today, don't forget he's a University of Chicago alum. He and Bob Lucas were in the same class, as a matter of fact, but that's, a, that's totally a footnote. But I think the structure is really this, that the, that the, uh, that the, that the, the family's playing a powerful role in my story but it's playing a powerful role and the state is in some sense enabling it. So policies that are thought to be equalizing are actually undermined by actually the fact that more affluent and more educated parents can take advantage of those. Now, I'm not suggesting that we, you know, we handicap more educated and affluent parents, 
the more the more human skill we produce, the better. But I do think that we shouldn't have just a naive trust in things like free college tuition, free health care. There's free health care. I mean, and it's high quality too. So a lot of what you heard from Sanders and from many others would suggest that those are really important remedies. And I would argue that I would pause there. And I would recognize that that targeting may in fact be a good strategy. <coughs> but recognizing there are disadvantaged people and there are some who benefit more than others should probably be an important part of public policy. Even though you'll always get the notion that you stigmatize people, say, oh, you know, I, I give this to the very poor people, I give it to, no, I think you really wanna be able to give research. But I do think, to me, it was surprising. It was very surprising how much of the inequality reduction was due to fiscal policy, just taxes and transfers in Denmark. And that if you look at taxes, if you look at income before tax and transfer, the equality, you know this, you documented this, that it's much, much greater, right? Pre-tax and transfer, that the world looks very different in Denmark. And that's one measure of human capacity for producing. That's what the market is paying. And, and then the rest is basically institutional features, what the wages are and so forth. So I'm not eliminating the family, I'm giving it a big role, but I'm, it's a subtle argument. I'm also pointing out that lifetime measures are probably better. I don't know what you consider to be a good measure of data these days. Uh, we were flirting with and have now looked at like, think of regressing your model, but taking value function on value function. You know, there are nonlinear versions of it in the Swedish paper and what I showed you now. And it's, the nonlinearity is interesting. Marginally, it's going down at the top, which surprised us too. So I think we need a deeper understanding of what neighborhoods are. So what would I say? I would be a little less enthusiastic about things that have to do with free tuition and so forth. I think it's far better to get the base of skills of the children ready. And if you really want true equality, tax and transfer policy will do it. We did have very low inequality in 1969 right at the end of the war on poverty, great society, Johnson lowered inequality. It was reduced substantially, but with it came a lot of complaints. Uh, and some of those complaints we documented in, in Denmark, I didn't show them today, but there were certain disincentive effects that were built in. Not just me, but people like Topel. And I think uh, Topel and uh, who's the guy at, uh, in our, uh, there's a guy in uh, Sweden at Uppsala, very, very good guy. I'm blocking on his name. But anyway, uh, they showed, you know, that there were strong disincentive effects built in. And their story there was, yes, you had very high taxes, but the Danes and the Swedes and the Scandinavians they studied weren't getting education at very high rates. And the reason is they were taxed so heavily. So the incentive to acquire skills. We have a version of that at the bottom of the distribution where people were enrolling children were enrolling in uh, training programs that offer generous incentives so and, and dropping out of school so uh, so I think it's that's not a new point but I would I would say don't don't go uh, don't rush into this uh, uh, reform I think it, a very strong a lot of the progressive suggestions that were out in the election and I still are debated which may be dead if the Republicans keep the Senate, but will may not be dead if they don't, um, still have a, a, a kind of an innocent faith in what's going on in Denmark. And so I would ask people to look at this more carefully because if we really want to eliminate inequality, like inequality at age three, at age five, at age 60, like I was showing, I think we need a more comprehensive policy, but state institutions play a role. I think that seems crazy not to admit that. Jim, I don't public, want to schools, be... public schools are the greatest source of social mobility in, in the US. They have been for generations. And uh, everybody acknowledges that. So uh, that's why no there's, there's so much more to say. I, 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 maybe I'll continue a conversation with you uh, offline, but I think a couple right. of students want to get in as well. Like, no, yes, I really would like, no, but I'd like your opinion on this. I can send you the slides. And we're writing this up in a paper. I really, I would like have... to keep contact with you. And especially if you think we're being unfair to yourself, to Chetty, or anything. I'm not, no. I'm not, 
I don't, I, honestly, I don't have an ax to grind. I, what I'm trying to look at is a more subtle vision of what inequality is and how this inequality appears. The Danes were horrified when they saw, when they saw those gaps by mother's education. They didn't believe it. And now they do. They say, what have we done wrong? And so, well, totally get it, but the consequences of those gaps aren't as great as they are in the U.S., right? No, they're not, because you have uh, you have insurance. You're right. You're right. The gaps I are think, not the same. I, I think both of but you. But they are, are the same both. when it comes to death. <laughs> both of you are wrong, Jim. You are emphasizing it, it, educating the children. What I think you should say as a conclusion of your result is not fiscal policy and so on and so on, which yes, I re reduce uh, inequality. I think what you are saying is mother, mother, mother. So let's educate the mother, tell them, invest in your children. That's the that's message I'm getting from your article. Okay, and are there other questions from students that want to Yeah, yeah, in? I want to give more questions to the students. So Jim, okay. we can talk about it later on. And May okay. Lee, May Lee yes. and yes. Austin. Go ahead. Yes, Professor Heckman. So according to the Gatsby curve, Nordic countries have high, higher social mobility than the US and China. But people generally believe high welfare depresses economic vitality. And we do see more activity in capital markets and new technology development in the US and China than in the Nordics, which also contributes to social mobility. So is there any way to measure the contribution of economic vitality to social mobility? And how do you see the common that high welfare state depresses economic vitality? Well, it partly depends on how the welfare state's financed. If you have extremely progressive rates, high progressive rates on, on which has been advocated now here by some, um, uh, you may discourage risk-taking and you may discourage investing in human capital. And, and that's an old, old line. So you might want to think about uh, if you have like a pure uh, Merlesian, Merlesian tax system, you might maybe want to have uh, zero marginal rates at the very top where you might get effort. But, 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 but I do think you're raising the point we talked about earlier, and I'd agree with it, that literally, uh, if you have too generous a state and you have taxes that distort substantially, then you might have real consequences. But, but there are a lot of ideas out there. So I think we should be more creative about thinking about taxes. You know, some of the work that's been done in, Den in, in the Netherlands, for example, about lifetime tax accounts and, you know, redistributing taxes over the lifetime. You know, we don't, the, at least in the tax systems in the US, and I also believe in Denmark, we don't properly tax and really provide the right incentives recognizing that people are gonna be low income at the beginning of life and relatively low income at the top of life. So we distort a lot of savings and work margins within the working life. So I think that's a real role for, for fiscal policy to examine. And it hasn't been, Lans Bovenberg in, the, in, in the Netherlands has done a lot of very interesting work on exactly that using some general equilibrium models. So I do think there's role. And you're right though, that if the taxes get too, look at one point, I, I was reading the Beatles tax rate, you know, this, there's a Beatles song called Tax Man. Tax Man was basically, it has a line in it, is you get 19 and I get one. And that's, that's because when they sang the song and they created the song, the marginal tax rate for people earning the kind of money the Beatles were, was basically 95%. So only kept 5%. And actually in Sweden, at one time, the marginal tax rate on income went over 100%. It went to like 110%. Ingmar Bergman, the famous filmmaker, uh, was, uh, uh, was actually uh, moved to the Faroe Islands, I think, a Danish pr province uh, to avoid taxes. So uh, no, I think the taxes can be very distorting. But you have to consider that policy together. If you, just, if you just say, look, what I don't like is the argument that goes on, which I think is dangerous and without at least being better informed, that if we soak the rich, we can pay for everything. Well, there aren't that many rich. People have done a lot of calculations. Maybe tax them more. I'm not opposed to that. I'm not, I'm not trying to make a political plea here either. 
But I do think you have to think broadly. You need a broad-based tax to support large-scale government programs. Absolutely. And I think you've got to make a structure where you you really recognize the power of incentives and the distortion. And so the point you're raising is very, very good one. You can you can damage. But still, people point to Nokia. They point to other Scandinavian states where there does seem to be some innovation. And, Lego, uh, Lego. What's that? Lego, but... Uh, Jim, Lego, you, yes, in Denmark, yeah, correct. Right. Let, uh, let me ask Rodoslov to ask a question and please answer in a minute, within a minute, Jim. Okay, okay, pro okay <laughs> Professor Heckman, just a, a couple of questions. Uh, how is the quality of schools measured? And I dislike the graduation rate measure uh, very much. Uh, should it uh, be equivalent to the quality of teachers? And question two, uh, should we uh, take uh, as one of the variables uh, time parents spend with their children? Rich people actually may not be educating their children at all at home. It's the nannies who do it. Oh, the importance of early life can't be overestimated. And that's part of what's going on in these Matthew effects. The kids are better able, if you have kids who are better prepared, they're better able to take advantage of any other public institution. And they're the ones who will be promoted more quickly. There'll be less of a burden on teachers and so forth. <coughs> but I do think that the structure of uh, the family in that regard, the, the early years play a huge role, no question about it, I'm not denying that. But they play a more subtle role and, and the institutions reinforce. So those early years playing such a substantial role, which you didn't talk that much about today, implicitly account for what I call these Matthew effects. The same parents who are investing in their children are the same parents who are putting those kids in better charter schools, making sure the teachers are good. Even in Denmark, which has basically this allegedly same school for all, there are local school boards and the parents get together and they can throw out a bad teacher. They can actually capitalize. They can actually raise some funds, not a lot, I guess, but they can supplement what's going on in the school. So there's an enormous role for offered public services to be supplemented by eager and willing parents. <clears throat> so there's a very... So there's an aspect of public policy about the response of the parents, which I think needs to be accentuated much more. The family response is, is powerful. So we were mentioning earlier tax incentives for people who are going to uh, going on to the uh, structure of uh, you know uh, education, going further to build uh, new new companies and new products. It's also true that you need the right incentive to essentially make even commonplace investments in your house and in your and in the market and so forth, and in your children and deciding what you consider valuable. So there's a big role, no question the parents play a big role. And I don't think we should deny that. I think it's a mistake. There have been some policies in the past. In California, about 40 years ago, there was an equalization measure passed. And I remember when it was passed, I was out at Stanford for the year. And I remember we discussed this a lot and it came true that what happened is they kept what parents could bring to the schools. And at that time, the private school, the public schools of California were as a group at a peak, they had very high peak. Now there were some very, a lot of variability, but parents supplemented those. Then they became prohibited from doing so and the quality of the schools declined. I think any measure that kind of forces equality of that type is counterproductive. I think we want more resources a parent and the society in building children and building opportunity. So I think we want to, however, maybe supplement the lives of disadvantaged children in ways, and oh, I'll use the word target that people don't want to uh, don't, don't want to discuss. But you had another point. Sorry, what was your first point? I'm sorry. I, uh, my my question was uh, whether. Um, the time parents spend with their children is more relevant than education of the parents. And the first question was, how do we measure the quality of school? And should it not be equivalent? Ah, to right, the right. Quality right. Of okay, let me take that question first. The quality of education at school is very nicely measured. 
because we actually know what the underlying test scores are of the teachers at those schools. And we know the education and affluence of their peers in the school. So we actually can, for each school in Denmark, measure the affluence and the kind of influence of the family on the children. So no question about it. Why do I use education? So, and that's one measure. And the teacher quality can be measured by the transcript of the teacher when she leaves or he leaves uh, college, which we can measure. And so we have very good measures and their grades in high school, we can measure those. So we actually have a very good track of how high quality or low quality the teachers are. And they sort, they sort. And as the sorting is very comparable to what's going on in the US. Maybe not fully comparable because money can't be sorting by means of payment. You don't attract them by payment, but you do attract them by means of offering them better, more motivated students and parents. So yes, in terms of what parent, parental education is just a proxy. And what we've learned, I mean, I have a study I'm doing now in rural China, very interesting study. And we're looking at actually uh, an active intervention where we're, it's a home visiting program. And these are among very poor uh, families in Western China, Gansu is the province. <clears throat> and what we're doing is we're giving weekly visits to these disadvantaged children living in rural China. And uh, we can measure the education of the parent we can measure the education of the caregiver because many of these kids have parents who've left to go into the city. Some of them even going as far as the East Coast. Uh, so we can have very detailed measures. And what we find even in those settings is that children of grandmothers usually who are the ones who are most disadvantaged, at the lower the level of education of the grandmother, the less she's aware of the importance of talking to the child and the lower the student outcomes. And we have experimental data. We're following these people week by week in terms of their achievement on various uh, test scores and uh, various uh, items, uh, both physical and uh, cognitive and social and emotional uh, measures we take weekly for over a period of about, oh, I guess some 16 months to 42 months. So we actually find yeah. the role of the parent plays a big role, very big. It's not just frequency of interaction, but the more educated parent knows something and can impart that to the child and, and has an expectation about where the child should be. So yes, both play a role, the time of the parent, yes. And it's not just the time, it's the nature of the interaction between the caregiver slash parent and the child that matters. So we know if I have a parent who's with the child 24 hours a day in a prison-like situation, sort of keeping the kid under lock and key, that's worthless. It may be harmful, deeply harmful, but what, what would be useful and what is useful is the more play, the more interaction, and that's the secret of this home intervention. And compared to control group children who don't get this kind of play and interaction, the treatment group children are developing at a much higher rate. So that's, that's good news. But it also suggests what you're saying. It's not just education, it's also play and it's also interaction, I would say. Okay, uh, Jim, uh, thank you very much. Let me ask uh, Christos to say a few words before we- Jim, uh, I'm uh, Christos Giannikos. I'm the executive officer of the program. Uh, on behalf of all of us, I wanted to say that it was an honor to have you with us. This was a very uh, interesting, exciting and dense talk. And I certainly <laughs> hope that we can have you again with us. I have a few questions of my own, but I hope I can ask them in the next time that you're around. Well, maybe you should have me on, Yakana, uh, next time just to answer questions. I, that, honestly, exactly I have a lot happened. of questions. That's exactly what happened. I would like to ask Miles a bunch of questions, and then we can yeah. actually get on the same wavelength. So We I, did the same with Bob Uman. That's what happened. So I apologize yeah. to people who are, you know, expecting that it will finish at 12.45. Jim, again, I thank you very much, and we should reschedule. I agree with you, yes. and we can do it. Uh, How is uh, Alman doing? I haven't seen him for a while. Uh, I forgot to invite him this time. I think he would be interested to come to you. He, he presented at the beginning of the semester in September. He's very good. He's, you know, active. Oh, of course he is. Where is he? Is he in Israel now? In or? Israel, in Jerusalem. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. But okay, he's, still, he's still healthy and 
and productive, right? Yes, yeah. very much. He presented the paper, you know, he compared uh, game theory and the uh, rational expectations. Okay. So how to uh, somehow combine the two together. And he went uh, game by game, you know, prisoner dilemma, battle of the sexes, one by one, one by one, the Bayesian uh, 